Are you an entrepreneur or ready to become a boss? Welcome to Hawaii Boss, the business podcast made in Hawaii, where you will hear from island movers and shakers on who they are and their impact on our state. And now, step into the office of your host for Hawaii Boss, David Pettyjohn. Everyone, today on Hawaii Boss, uh, we are entering into the big boss's office of Mr. Hilton Raythal, who is the president and CEO of the Healthcare Association of Hawaii, or better known as HAH, and quite a prominent uh, figure in our most recent uh, pandemic history. But we're here to not just talk about the pandemic. Here on Hawaii Boss, we want to find out what makes uh, Mr. Raythal tick, or at least what got him into this line of work. Maybe we'll, we're going to find out a little bit more about him and, and uh, what makes him uniquely, I think, positioned uh, for this role. And and hopefully we can glean, uh, glean some advice and some good counsel and and uh, hopefully maybe see some rays out of this this uh, post-pandemic life we're all living in. And again, Hilton, uh, thank you for accepting this uh, invitation to, to meet and, and talk today about you. Happy to do so. Sure, sure. So, Raythal, it's not Hawaiian, is it? Uh, no, it's not, actually. Uh, I'm originally from Australia, but my uh, father's side is from Germany. My okay. mother's side is from England. And uh, but so the name is actually a derivative of a German name. Oh, that happens over time as immigration happens. I guess names change over time, and and uh, you know Silverman becomes Silver, or you know I, my my last name Petty John used to be uh, it was a uh, French uh, Petit Jean, and then it was anglicized through Petit Jean. You know, sort of I had these French uh, refugees, you know, moving through Europe. So anyway. Great, great history. So England and, and Germany, that's uh, uh, quite a combination. Um, so you must have picked up your work ethic from these two, uh, these, this background of your, uh, what, what kind of work did your parents do? Did your parents work? Um, my mother was a homemaker. She actually uh, was a secretary before she met my father. My father described himself as a jack of all trades and master of nuns. <laughs> so he did a variety of different jobs. Um, he painted houses, he drove taxis, he delivered dry cleaning. Um, so did a number of different jobs over the years, um, uh -huh. but not, did not have any particular skilled profession, certainly did not have a college degree and didn't actually even finish high school. So my mother was more highly educated than he was, but... Um, we had, I was the third of five children, and so uh, she was a homemaker, and um, again, my, my father was the uh, outside breadwinner for the house. Mm -hmm. Well, um, two roles that are, have changed over time, the breadwinner versus the uh, homemaker, uh, lots of change around that. We're not going to get a lot in that, but that's something we could, we, we could talk about in, in the future, certainly you know, different roles have changed, but, but for you, when, when is your first job? What, what was your first job? Well, my first actual paid job right. was when I was nine years old and my father got me a job and my two older brothers jobs at a gas station. And okay. in Australia, we call it a petrol station. Okay. And so I would actually work and I and my brothers would work every Sunday and public holidays at this gas station. My job was checking the air pressure on tires. And so that was the okay. first paid job that I started when I was nine years old. But so I'm guessing first, it was like maybe $4 an hour, 4 or $5? Uh, 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 way less than that. I, I, okay. Uh, um, so, yeah. <laughs> no minimum wage in Australia at the time? No, I'm not even sure the job was legal because of my right. age. I actually worked there for a number of years, um, again, on Sundays uh -huh. and public holidays. But uh, I, I had people, actually customers, who would ask me that question, are you even legal working here? So right, right. Even though I was big for my age, you know, a nine-year-old is still a nine-year-old. So. Sure. Right. They're child labor laws. You know, those are, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but certainly, I mean, sounds like you, you mentioned first paid job. Sounds like you worked from a much younger age with uh, maybe in family roles that you had. Absolutely. So I, um, uh, I was always busy, um, developed a very strong ethic work uh, very early on from my father. Mm -hmm. So I worked, um, you know, we used to 
pick flowers, for example, and sell them. We grew flowers in our garden and we, uh, we would pick them and my father would sell them. We would uh, um, harvest almonds, for example, off almond trees and sell those. Um, and then I had that job at the gas station and some other jobs I had. So I have always worked from a very early age and worked all my way through college. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, that's, that's just how I was brought up and, um, and how, how my life has always been. Well, it sounds like uh, work was sort of established. It sounds like your father though, although he didn't have any sort of formal education, I'm not sure industry is something they can teach anymore, being industrious and sort of creative in, in, in solving, so, you know, raising a family of five is no small feat. Yeah, so that was, um, it was out of necessity as much as anything. And the reason us kids were put to work oh, sure. um, is because of, of that factor, you know, to help the family out. Because my father did not have a profession per se, um, mm -hmm. money was always tight. We didn't know. It's just the way we grew up. I didn't know that I was, um, if it was middle class, it was sort of on the bottom, the very bottom end of middle class. I mean, we right. lived in a house, but it was a two bedroom, one bath house. And there were seven of us living in that house. Um, we grew most of our own vegetables, had a very large vegetable garden. And mm -hmm. um, it's again, single income, uh, just my father working outside of the house. So yeah, the, the work was uh, mu as much a matter of uh, survival. And um, I mean, we had, you know, we had a car, we had, you know, the house, um, very modest house. Um, but I remember, you know, not having much when I was growing up in the term of comforts or, you know, nice clothes. Um, you know, it's just, but that's how we grew up. And, and that was the life we lived. Right. You don't really know anything different. I mean, I was, that's how I grew up. I was, uh, my parents were bakers. And, uh, and so I grew up, I didn't know what the difference, blue collar, or white collar, or any of this stuff. I would just, you know, I, we learned how to work because that's how you, you, you fed ourselves. You know, we, we got up and we, but that's when I decided though, Hilton, that uh, 11 o'clock in the morning was too early to get up and make the donuts or 11 o'clock at night, basically. I, it was too much. I saw them just barely half of their life because they were in this other world, you know, living their lives. So what motive was, what was the motivation for you to, to sort of educate yourself and help maybe escape out of that? I wouldn't say escape, but sort of create a different circumstance for yourself. Yeah. So that's even, even though that's the world I grew up in and the environment I lived in, and that's, you know, my parents' friends were in that same social status. Mm -hmm. um, I just felt that there was always something more than that. But um, I left high school and went out into the workforce and was quite successful as a young adult. Um, in my early to mid 20s, I became a branch manager for a company in Melbourne, Australia, and had a company car, had a very good job, was married by that time. I got married very young and, and had a couple of children. But I just felt that there really had to be something better. And even though I had this great job, I, it wasn't something that I saw myself doing long term. So I ended up leaving Australia and coming to the United States to the West Coast to get a degree. And the original intent was just to get a degree, um, you know, study abroad, get a degree and then go back to Australia. But I, I never got around to going back, but I found my calling when I Got, after I did my finished my undergraduate degree, I started a graduate program and then found a got a part time job in healthcare at a hospital in East Los Angeles, just because okay. I was looking for some part time work while I was working on my MBA. And so I got a part time job. And again, it was just to get a job, right? So I had something right. to do some source of income while I was working on my MBA. And three weeks after I started, I was offered a full-time job. So it turned from a part-time job to a full-time job. I switched from the MBA program to an MPH program or a master's mm -hmm. in public health and then did a master's in health administration. But I literally found my calling in life in healthcare because I got that part-time job simply because I was looking for something to do while I was working on my graduate degree. So even though by then I was in my very early 30s, I'd still not discovered what I wanted to do in life, but when I right. got that job, found healthcare, 
started that and love it with a passion and have been in, been in the uh, healthcare arena in a number of different roles ever since. Well, I mean, that's an amazing story, but because you, that's how it is sometimes. You just don't know what's going to, if you haven't latched onto something, sometimes it's early, sometimes it's late, but it's still good to keep looking. You know, if you're not quite sure, keep preparing yourself because I think I might, I'm guessing that part-time job might not have pulled into a, turned into a full-time job if you hadn't quite presented well. And if you were just looking for a job, I think that probably that three, within that three weeks, you were able to show some things. What, what experience in that three weeks, I guess you said it sort of changed your life. What, 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 was there any certain experience that said healthcare is for me right there? Yeah, I, I had, um, Again, the whole reason I went back to school or went or not say went back to school is went to college is because I was looking for, you know, meaning in my life for fulfillment other than, other than just earning money. There's nothing wrong with earning a good salary, but the job I had in Melbourne, again, great job, but it just wasn't fulfilling. And so when I found this job and actually did an undergraduate degree in psychology because I thought, well, being a psychologist would be very fulfilling and sure. very rewarding and it's a great career. But I, but I discovered it wasn't for me. So I did this undergraduate mm-hmm. degree, but then decided, well, that's not really what I wanted to do either, even though I'd gone to all the work to get a degree. And I don't regret getting the degree right. because it's a prerequisite for doing other sure. things. But when I got this job in healthcare and the, my boss actually at the time, who was a vice president in the company, um, one of the senior leadership people, I was very fortunate to work for someone like that who gave me some opportunities. And I very early on, the hospital I was working at was going through some very significant financial crisis at that point in time. And so I I just found myself in a situation where I I almost just became alive. I sort of found, well, this is what I was looking for. I didn't know what I was looking for until I found it. When I got into healthcare, I realized this is where I wanted to be. It just made sense to me. It just it was a good fit for me from a personality, from a style perspective. Mm-hmm. And again, I've been doing it ever since. I've had a number of different roles. My, my career has you know, gone from Southern California to Hawaii um, to my current role. Not every role has been great in that, in that career, but I've, you know, I have progressed during all of that time to get to the position where I am now. Sure. And so now... Would you would say you might be you might call you, you someone in your position at the pinnacle of their career? Possibly you may have other aspirations, however. But well, we'll go into there. Someone has has reached where they where where they they want to be. What what are so as a so you can consider yourself a boss, a leader? Do you have a team around you? What, 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 how do you uh, what's an important part from a boss's perspective? What do you have to do to build a great team? What's the boss's role in building a team around you? That's makes you successful well for one i really like being a boss Um, this (laughs) is my first ceo role i've done it for almost four years now i've had a number of senior leadership positions over the last few years but i absolutely love being a boss i love that freedom and i love that responsibility i don't have a boss per se i report to a board um, but i don't have anyone looking over my shoulder every day now i'm accountable every day to all of our members Um, and to the board, but um, I love that freedom. But in terms of the team, you know, one of the things I've learned over time, and especially in healthcare, and this may apply to other industries as well, but certainly for healthcare, I, healthcare is a very, very different career field. It's very personal. It's very intimate. It's very emotional. It's a lot of dollars involved because it's a huge industry in the United States, but it touches everyone every single individual at some point or many points in our lives. And I love that. I love the responsibility that comes with being in healthcare. But for me, because it has that responsibility, I really believe that if you're going to be successful in healthcare and if you're going to be part of my team, you have to be committed to what we're doing. This is not just a job. This is not just about having a specific set of skills. This is not just about being incredibly smart. I'm looking for smart people. I'm looking for people who have good skills and we can teach other skills. But one of the things you can't teach is passion and commitment to this mission of healthcare sure. and, and helping our communities and this, and this sense of serving, you know, serving our communities. And so 
what I'm looking for then is people who are smart, who have very, you know, a very good skill set, but most of all have that commitment to what we're doing because this is tough. And especially when you go through the pandemic and what we've been going through over the last sure. year, this is not easy at all. And what gets you going every single day is that sense of purpose, that sense of commitment. So I am, I'm incredibly fortunate to have a really great team and the success, I can only be successful if I have my team supporting me and backing me up. And that's everyone on our team, not just our senior leaders on the team, but every single individual on that team because they all have a very important play, uh, part to play. Well, absolutely. And you have to, you, you become the, the, the voice, I guess, and, and face of all of that activity. You know, certainly recently, let's, we can turn your experience in the last year and, 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 and as this pandemic started, walk us back there and you're in this key critical position. You're on, you know, you're, when any sort of emergency happens in health, you know, tsunamis come, Hawaii Healthcare Association is, is there, um, uh, different uh, tsunamis come, or not tsunamis, but hurricanes, you know, different disasters come. Uh, like you said, it, point, it, it touches every life. And so the healthcare is right at the, at the table every time. And so you're an important voice uh, that happens. Walk me through as the reality of this, the size of this thing started hitting you and, and you're supposed to be at the best at your game. How, and everyone else also in senior leadership throughout the government and, and nationally sort of begin to recognize it. Tell me how what, your role in that and sort of helping to bring all that together. And first, just tell me your emotional response. What was it like when you, you know, it's, you got up out of the bed in the morning, but I'm, I'm sure some days were tougher than others during the last year. Tell us a little bit about your, your little walk there this last year. Well, it has been actually very tough. And I have worked, I've always worked hard ever since I was a kid. Um, and I've worked hard in all the different roles I've had, but I've never worked as hard as I had during this last 12 months. For the first month of the pandemic, I was literally in my office every day for a month. I did not take a single day off in a month. So, and during the week, I was working 12 to 14 hours on the weekends. I was only putting in eight to 10 hours on the weekends in my office. So I did that every day for a month. Um, we, as part of the association, one of our responsibilities is emergency preparedness on, and disaster planning for um, over 170 or 180 healthcare organizations across the state of Hawaii. That's one of the responsibilities we have is to help those organizations prepare for the, any disaster, hurricanes, tsunamis, um, volcanic eruptions, mm -hmm. pandemics. Sure. Um, any, any type of, and, and we do training and we've got a team that does that. We get a federal grant every year to help do that. We have all this equipment, supplies, you know, we can stand up these mash type tents where we could stand up a, a mobile 150 bed hospital um, with air conditioning and all the carts and equipment and everything else. So, so we do all of that and we pre prepare for those. And we've had, you know, some things, you know, we've had, in the last few years, you know, I've had some uh, near misses with hurricanes, for example. Sure. And we do planning and disaster drills. But the pandemic is very, very different for a couple of reasons. One of them is it's a worldwide event. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just a local event. And one of the other biggest differences is that even if you have a hurricane or a flood or like what's happening on the North Shore of Kauai right now where that mm -hmm. community is cut off, they tend to be fairly transitory events. So they last for, you know, a day, a few days, a couple of weeks. Um, you know, the North Shore of Kauai was cut off for a, a many weeks, um, um, about 18 months ago. So sure. some are longer than others, but they're fairly, you know, they're fairly well defined. They have a be defined. They have a beginning point. They have an end point. The pandemic, when the, when the pandemic first started or before it was even called a pandemic, we were looking with concern at these reports that are coming out of China. And I remember talking to some individuals at the time and saying, look, there's one of two things that could happen here. One of them is it could blow over. It just be, could be contained in Wuhan, right. in China. And there'll be some, maybe some repercussions for a while, but it's going to blow over. Or the alternative is that it could develop into a full-blown pandemic. Well, obviously, 
you know, now 15 months later from when this first started back in the end of 1990, 1999, mm -hmm. we're still dealing with the repercussions from this pandemic. So, and for us, we've gone through different phases. You know, initially, once it really developed into a pandemic, we had this huge focus on PPE, if you remember, we were totally unprepared as a state, as a nation, in terms of PPE, and we were just overwhelmed by the need. So we were spending an incredible number of hours every day trying to source PPE, get PPE, figure out, you know, just what was going on. So for the first few months, there was this incredible focus on PPE. And then it started to get a little better after a while. But then we, in the latter part of last year, we ran into a, a, a personnel scenario or shortages where sure. as we went August, September, as our numbers started to go up and we'd had an earlier bump, but it wasn't that big a bump. But then in August and September, where we got up to where we had almost 300 COVID patients a day in our hospitals across the state, in addition to other hospitals, it really stretched our human resources. Sure. And so we switched from PPE to human resources and we ended up getting some state money, fortunately, or access to money from the state that was federal money to help bring in resources from the mainland. Mm -hmm. And now, and, and we got through that, and now we, we're into this whole vaccination initiative. So the last few months, and, and, we, and right now, we're continuing to focus on vaccination. So we've gone through these different phases and different areas of priority mm -hmm. during right. this pandemic, which means we've had to pivot and we're having to figure all this out as we go through, because I don't know about you, David, but for me, this is my first pandemic. I, you know, and uh, for everyone to yeah, mine too. And I try to give advice, but I really can't. I don't know. It's the first time I try to tell my children, my senior daughter is trying to graduate this year and is very upset about all of this. And, uh, and I don't, I, I can't offer any good advice because, uh, you know, I've never been through it either. You know, we're all facing this together uh, new first for the first time. I know if there's a pandemic coming up, we'll be ready, but, uh, and I hope we don't have to deal with that, but certainly, um, I think because of, well, it's, it's good that we were able to, to get enough resources together. And I think that was part of what your role was is, is really, so how would you describe your job in all of that? Then what is your job, Hilton Rathal? Well, our primary job um, we are a advocacy organization and we represent over 170 healthcare organizations across the state of Hawaii, which is every hospital in the state, public and private, even Tripler is one of our members. We represent all the nursing homes, all the home health agencies, hospices, assisted living facilities, some DME providers and other organizations. So that's our job is we're an advocacy organization mm -hmm. that is, is, that is, we are funded by Jews from our members, and our job is to advocate on behalf of our members. Now, normally that means like, you know, we work with the state legislature, we work with our congressional delegation, mm -hmm. we work with regulatory agencies, we work with payers, and advocate on behalf of our members, you know, depending on what the issue is. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the pandemic, our role has been to help coordinate all of our, with all of our members, and then to coordinate with both local and federal agencies. So we are working very, very closely with Department of Health, working very closely with the governor's office, the lieutenant governor, working with our congressional delegation. We're working with national organizations like the American Hospital Association. Mm -hmm. So our job is to support all of our members, all these hospitals, nursing homes, all these other organizations, so they have all the tools and resources that they need to take care of people in their organization. So whether it's PPE, our job was to figure out how do we get them as much PPE or the right types of PPE, make sure it's not, you know, it's, it's not counterfeit PPE, you know, that it's actually good quality. The real stuff, stuff, right. And we can get it at the best price we can because the yeah. prices went up dramatically and are still much higher. We were, we were paying five to 10 times as much for PPE at the peak of the, at the, peak of the pandemic than we were pre-pandemic. Pre so so that, is, and, and that was our role with PPE. When it came to human resources, we got all of our, we figured out what the needs were for all of our members. 
we went to the state, were able to get access to millions of dollars mm -hmm. from the state to go and contract with a mainland company sure. to bring in literally hundreds of individuals into the state mm -hmm. to support our hospitals and long-term care facilities. And now with the vaccinations, what we are doing is we're coordinating every single week with the Department of Health right. and the federal government to help allocate and distribute vaccines across the state of Hawaii to make sure that every single individual in the state of Hawaii who's eligible for a vaccine uh -huh. can actually get the vaccine. So that's our role is to coordinate and advocate uh, all of those, uh, coordinate all of those activities and advocate on our behalf of our members so they can be as effective as possible in doing their jobs. And it's like a finely oiled machine. Nothing goes wrong ever, Hilton, and it's just, you just turn, wind up the clock in the morning and let it go, and then it just, then you just put it to bed at night and everything's fine. So I know it's probably overwhelming sometimes. So how do you, how do you detach and have some fun? Do you have a hobby? How do you, you know, you got to keep things uh, in perspective. How do you keep things in perspective? That, what you just described was a, an amazing, incredible thing that your organization does, but you can't do it all by yourself. You've got a team, but how do you keep yourself sharp and excited about coming in? That sounds like a lot of weight you're, you're carrying around there. How do you do it? Well, it is, but again, I, I love my job with a passion. I love healthcare with a passion. Um, again, I literally found my calling in life when I got into healthcare and that, that, you know, belief that I'm doing something, that my team is doing something, we're really contributing, we're giving back, we're serving our communities. That really helps. But I, I do have a couple of hobbies. I love stand-up paddling, for example. And so okay. during, um, even during the pandemic on the weekends, I, I go out first thing in the morning um, and go paddling for an hour, hour and a half, you know, just for exercise. And I love sure. doing that. Oh, I yeah. also... Um, work on home improvement projects. I love, you know, just doing things around the house. Okay. So I do have a couple of hobbies, um, but um, it's, I, I work pretty long days and uh, don't have time to paddle during the week, but those hobbies really give me a break because on the weekend, you know, when I'm out paddling, sometimes I'll find myself just, you know, enjoying it. And other times I'll be working on solve, trying to solve problems while I'm paddling, sure. you know, while I'm exercising out there. And okay. Then, you know, so but, but the, the, uh, the home improvement projects, I mean, that really helps because that's a distraction. It's physical work. It's a, you know, you're working on projects, you're working on, you know, improving your house, um, uh -huh. doing renovations or whatever. And so that's a good sort of stress release. And even though I may work hard on the weekends, it's different type of work. And so I then sort of, you know, okay, I've worked hard on the weekend. I'm done with that. Now it's time to go back to the office. And that change of right. pace. I find really helps me because they're very different uh -huh. things, right? The the mm -hmm. office work and being on calls and being talking to the phone and doing all these emails, that's very different to either being up paddling or working on home projects. And I find that, you know, those two different facets to actually complement each other and help me get through each week. That's awesome. Yeah, you have to find a way. Well, have you ever found it? Give me an example where maybe you've had a boss that you didn't, I mean, that you didn't really get along with that well and how you dealt with those issues. Everybody wants to know like, okay, just quit the job. But if you like the job, but the boss, how do you, from, from your perspective, you're at the top now and maybe you work with the governor and I know you can't fire the governor. So, but what about, what about, you know, a guy out there is listening right now is it Taco Bell and wants to talk some sense into his boss and say, listen, the schedule could be more fair if we did it this way. Uh, uh, maybe a budding boss or somebody like that who in the future sees what's what's some advice to some of those young up and comers or a boss who's a boss now that wants to get a little bit better. What's maybe one or two little tidbits that says this, this helped, this, this might help you. Okay. Well, I'm a great believer in perseverance. Um, it's one of those traits that I learned very early on um, just persisting. And I, while I've had a fantastic career in healthcare, not every position I've had and not every boss I had has been great. And so I've had a couple of challenging bosses. And, um, so one of the, you know, one of the ways I've dealt with it is, um, is again, you, you do your job to the best of your ability, even if there is, even if it is a challenging environment. Um, mm -hmm. Now, 
bosses can change, you know, because organizations change over time. So sometimes, you know, you end up, you're reporting to one person and it may not be great, but then you find out, you know, that person gets moved into a different position or they leave or whatever, um, and you end up with a different boss and that may work out better. So, sure. yeah, so that's, that's one way that that happens um, where the, where you don't change um, or your role doesn't change, but the, the, the stressful situation or the environment changes. Sure. The other, the other way, um, and, I, and I've had that, where my boss, you know, the person I didn't particularly get along with that great moved into a different role and I got a different boss um, who was much easier to work with and we got along much better. The other uh, situation is where you find yourself in a situation where you, you and your boss are not um, necessarily really compatible and uh, in that instance, I ended up leaving and moving into a different role, so sure. a different company. So there's different approaches, but um, time, you know, and it's really, it's much harder when you're younger because you don't have that same sense of time. Sure. Right? Because, you know, you've only had the experience you've got and you want things to be better right now. Right. Um, but again, that, that sense of persistence that I have and perseverance uh -huh. Um, where I just hang in there, I'm a little tenacious. Um, yeah, sounds like so a little patient, is, patience, is, yeah, got, patience uh, combined with sort of this tenacity to, to find a better way. And maybe this boss won't help me get there, but uh, I know a way. Maybe there's a boss that'll listen to me, and uh, exactly, right. exactly. And you, sometimes, if you just wait, I think people have regretted it sometimes too. They left, and then all of a sudden, that other boss left, and like, oh, I left all my people, you know, oh, what happened? So, a little patience. We'll be just fine. That's good advice. Good advice, sir. Um, well, it, I so much appreciate your time. We're, we're trying to get this, the, the folks like you who are out there working hard every day in complex organizations or other organizations that, that, uh, you know, that lead people or work with people. I think everyone has a potential to be a boss, minimally of themselves. And then, and then a good boss we always want to work for. And so we're trying to crack the code on what's a good boss. And hopefully you've given us a, a good, good head start, Hilton. And, uh, and hopefully uh, as we develop the program and continue that uh, in the future, hopefully you can help us uh, maybe with some other questions related to as we go into HR and different leadership types of skills, traits. You mentioned style and different things. So we want to, we want to bring this kind of stuff out to the fore instead of hidden behind the, the cloistered MBA walls back there. We can talk about how we want to do it here in Hawaii. And, and I think, that's really what we weren't able to get to. And I'd like to pursue that further is other businesses, how when they want to enter in, into Hawaii, and if you have time for this last question, we can just grab it in there. And businesses and, and folks that want to enter Hawaii and do business, you know, what are some, what's some advice for those folks as well? Well, Hawaii is an incredible place to live. Um, you know, I used to work in California, I grew up in Australia, so I've lived in different places. Um, and every state in the United States says they're different and they're all, you know, they all have un the, the, the unique uh, aspects. But Hawaii is very different. Um, one thing, it's, you know, it's literally out in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, it's a small state. Um, and but that small state creates a real sense of community. And, and it's one of the things uh, I love about Hawaii. There's lots of things I love about Hawaii. Uh, you know, the ocean, the clean air. The sure. Rain. Etc. Love all of those things, but that one of the things I value most is that sense of community that we're all out here together. And so, Hawaii's not for everyone because you know different people have different styles. And if um, you know if 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 your style and your personality doesn't work with a the culture in Hawaii and the way that things work together, if if you're not willing to, sometimes things may take a little longer. You know doesn't mean that people don't work hard, but, you know, decision-making may, may take a little longer, may take longer to get some things done. So some people may find that be very, very impatient with that. Um, right. That spirit of collaboration, you know, you, you, you've got to be careful who you, you know, angry at because sure. they could be your friends, they could be your neighbors, they could be, you know, could be relative, um, could be relatives. <laughs> they could be relatives. So, <laughs> right. so Hawaii does have some unique characteristics. It doesn't lend itself to every different, every, every personality type. So sure. if you value your community, if you value the environment, if you value family, if you value patience, if you value, you know, build, building a, 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 well-functioning society. Um, I, I think there's 
huge opportunities in Hawaii. We have so much to offer in terms mm -hmm. of incredible natural beauty, in terms of, you know, the spirit of aloha, the sense of ahana. Sure. You know, it's, it's a fantastic place for kids. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of money to entertain your kids. You know, you can right. go out and do so many things. Right. So it's a great place to bring, bring up a family, but it's not for everyone. But for the right individuals, it's a phenomenal place to live and work. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And this is uh, where we call home. I have uh, part of my family because of the pandemic is on the big island. Uh, my wife and my uh, two daughters who are still in school. We were trying to make the jump over here, but but somehow me working here and then traveling intermittently is working. And I thought that would never be able to work. But but that you make a point. It's not for everybody. I hear some people talk to me. I don't know what you're doing, David. That's crazy. But it works. It offers us the opportunity to, you know, to go back and forth. And, and there's so much to see on the different islands as well. Um, there's, there's really an opportunity, I think, for, for smart minds like yourself and, and others who we hope to interview and, and to really sort of bring this out and say, you know, aloha isn't uh, a marketing slogan. It's, it's a real thing. It is very real. It is very right. tangible. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, it's an incredible place to live, you know, from that perspective. Sure. But again, that doesn't suit everyone. It doesn't suit everyone's style. If people are looking for lots of action, if they're looking for major league teams, if they're looking for the huge sporting events, right. you know, you're not going to get that. So, but, um, but for the right individuals, um, there, there are some incredible opportunities. And I'm excited about the potential for Hawaii in the future. Absolutely. Well, I'd hope so. And I know, I think there's, there's several more out there that we're, we're trying to crack the code right now. Really it is. Uh, there's lots of, lots of work to do as we try and rebuild here post pandemic and, and maybe just the same old way that we used to do it isn't the way that we need to do it. And so we're also looking for creative ideas on pathways forward um, to make, uh, to continue to keep Hawaii full of aloha and uh, keep Hawaii, Hawaii. So uh we're glad that we could get your perspective and here on Hawaii Boss and look forward to speaking with you in the future, Hilton. Take good care and uh, maybe we'll see you out there on the, on the paddle board. Make sure to subscribe to Hawaii Boss and follow us on social media at Hawaii Boss Podcast at the links in the description. We'll see you soon in the boss's office.